machine shop friends and welcome to another old steam powered machine shop video. Uh, if you're new to this channel, this shop was put together years ago by me to replicate an early 1925 job shop run on steam power and, and generates regular revenue and uh, has all the problems and, and challenges of working day to day with steam power, how the machines are hooked up, how they run, <clears throat> and actually doing the work with uh, old style measuring devices and tooling. Uh, on this episode we're uh, going to finish up the uh, uh, gearbox job uh, for the uh, round hay baler that I started in the last one and uh, this, this one shows uh, building a uh, shaft for the gearbox and uh, there we've got some clips from the front shop doing some modern work too and uh, I'm getting involved into making a uh, prototype crosshead for the Liley steam engine that I've been rebuilding here for the last couple of years and uh, hopefully this crosshead will be a design that would be easy to uh, uh, make in future engines. Uh, and uh, so <clears throat> this is how it went down and uh, thanks a lot for watching, coming along and uh, I appreciate the comments and uh, all the likes and, and subscriptions and uh, we'll get to the video. Thanks again. This is a sketch of the shaft that I worked up from the broken shaft and uh, you can see it's got several diameters that have to be turned and a couple of keyways cut in it and uh, there's a bevel gear that presses on here so this dimension has got to be really close to get the right press fit on it and uh, um, I'm building it out of uh, a piece of stress proof steel. So we'll get started at it. Got the piece turned around and I'm roughing out the other two diameters on the other end of it. One 
finished cutting about 5,000 after this on the last diameter. One thing that's kind of annoying me is that I got this piece of steel uh, stress proof from Speedy Metals and the doggone thing is magnetized. The chips stick to it. I have never had that problem before. I've talked to some folks that said they have. I don't know what causes it, whether it happens in the manufacture of the metal or whether it's something that happens to it while between there and me in the warehouse or cutting it off or what. See, mostly in this end. That's the final cut on this diameter. You can see how the chips are magnetized. Now the piece is magnetized. You see, now it's even got my tool holder magnet. magnetized. It's just amazing. This diameter right here is the one I'm the most concerned about because it's got a gear that goes on here and it's quite a heavy press fit so it, the dimension has got to be right and I think I'm about four thousandths off it right now.
Okay, the next operation is we got to put a 7 16 keyway in the new shaft. Tom's working on the 1925 South Bend lathe here. Making some half inch 12 nuts out of some hex stock. This is his setup. Gill them, tap them, cut them off. And here's one already made. So we need about a half a dozen of each. And we'll be making the studs for the single point tool. Here's Tom making a stud. Final pass is with a non-standard die. One half twelve to finish one side of the stud. This is a local job I'm doing for an Amish friend of mine up the road. It's uh, a conveyor for a horse-drawn potato picking machine. And the conveyor goes together in links. And this chain was really rusted, worn, and falling apart. So he commissioned me to make him a whole new chain. And so I'm bending up the pieces here putting them together, I'll show you how it goes. I made this jig and I'm bending them with heat and there's a few critical dimensions on them and because they go over a sprocket they've got to be the right distance apart and uh, the right length and all that so I finally got my uh, jig here tuned up and I'm turning out some good parts. Kind of a laborious operation.
one of the critical dimensions is the distance on the pitch, and it should be about one inch, or uh, yeah, one inch, one twenty-five, and that's one inch, one twenty. one inch one sixty so I'm in the spec the sprockets that this goes on are really worn and big and loose and the tolerance isn't that tremendous but this this conveyor runs over the spot the plow's got a double V in the front and some other hooks and things they pull it behind two horses and it digs up the potatoes and shoves the, all the dirt toward the back and it runs up this conveyor and there's a oval shaped sprocket that uh, runs again uh, like an idler that runs against it in the middle of the run and it makes this go up and down it shakes the dirt out between the between the bars here and then it goes around the drive sprocket or around the drive sprocket on the bottom and comes back and the whole thing is about uh, maybe oh eight feet long and it's going to take about 64 of these so it's going to be a while It's kind of a pain to relight the torch every time, but I figured that might save a little gas. This is about 26 bars. The whole conveyor is 64 bars. And uh, it's ready to go back to my Amish friend Isaac so he can get going on digging his potatoes. Taking a little break here because I got some heads out here in the shop that I got to get out and uh, I thought you might be interested to see how I do valve guides on cast iron heads. These are some uh, 390 Ford heads. 
they're pretty typical of old cast iron heads in that they don't really have replaceable valve guides. The, uh, the valve bores are just bored out in the cast iron so when they get worn the typical way to do it was to knurl them and ream them which is really kind of a Mickey Mouse thing to do or bore them oversized with some special cutters and put in some uh, like half inch slugs uh, that have the have the holes have to be reamed uh, about one and a half thousands undersize uh, these are usually on dimension right at half inch and then they have to be pressed in cut to length uh, drilled and reamed for the valve and it's a lot of work and this is a new way to do it and these are these are called uh, thin wall bronze guide liners and I've been using them for quite a few years and they, it makes an exceptionally good job if they're put in right. And what they are is uh, real thin wall phosphor bronze bushing. Uh, they're uh, 30 thousandths thick tubing that's rolled up into a bushing and it's got a spiral down the inside of it for oil retention. It's not continuous. It, it's at the uh, joint here it's offset so there's not a continuous path through there <clears throat> and they're pressed in tight and then swedged to size and it just really works good and it's pretty fast and it makes a, a very in fact this stuff I'll show you that you've got to swedge them to size by stretching them in there you can't even ream them you could take a brand new bronze reamer and run it in there with lube and it'll get about halfway down through there and it'll start squealing and squawking and seize up and you drive it out and there's not a single chip on it. It's, it's amazing how, how that is. So the first thing in the process is to ream them. Uh, special carbide reamer uh, 60 thousandths over with a pilot on the end of it and uh, this is a rig for holding everything straight uh, it sort of uh, has a tapered bushing the different size ones for different size valves that locates the reamer right exactly square with a hole over it and as air pressure pushes it down so you can see better. <clears throat> when you swedge it to size you have a series of ball brooches and these are tool steel with bumps on them 
that are half thousandth apart in diameter and then these are half thousand steps above those so you run them in consecutively until you get to the, to the size you want to fit the valves and the manufacturers mess around with the valve stems and like Ford Chrysler and uh, Chevy and tractors and stuff some of them will put this valve right on the nominal size and make the uh, make the guide a couple thousandths bigger some of them will put the guide on nominal size and make the valve stem a couple thousand smaller so you got in order to do this you have to be able to uh, hit within maybe a four thousandth range in order to get things to fit right so put the ball brooch in there and drive it with this one I can't hear anything. Try the valve in there and it just, I mean, it just slides down there. There's maybe a thousandth or a thousandth and a half of uh, clearance and the uh, guideliner people say you can run clearances so tight with these because the bronze is sort of self-lubricating and it it cools better as you can run tighter clearances so you don't actually even have to run any valve stem seals but of course we do so that's right where I want these so I'm going to do the other three Let's see And there's the finished guide with the guide liner in it. This is the crosshead for the Lyle engine and uh, I wanted to show you this because this is <laughs> kind of a strange thing. Uh, of course the idea here in rebuilding these engines for me is to kind of reverse engineer the production procedures and the, the machines that were used and the setup and and how they made the individual parts of these engines and uh, this is the cross head and this is the part that the connecting rod hooks on this end and the steam piston rod hooks on this end and it slides on these rails bottom on each side. Uh, we planed these off in an episode preceding and this slides back and forth of course. So the cross head is, if you look at it, it's really kind of a simple thing but if you sit down with a pencil and paper and a ruler and you try to design one from scratch that will do the job <clears throat> It's really a lot harder than you think because you got the different elements of the design that all have to fit together and you have to be able to machine it and you have to be able to deal with this pin which is uh, the bearing pin and of course everything has to be in straight in line. So <clears throat> I'm looking at this and this pin appears to be cast as part of this and I can't, if it's a one piece casting, how in the world did they machine this in here? <clears throat> I don't think they set it in the mold and then cast things around it. 
which is, is possible, I suppose. But anyway, I've looked at it, looked at it, and it, it, it appears from what I can see here and over here that there is no parting line. It's part of the part of the casting. So the pin diameter is a little bigger than this dimension here. So uh, to bore a hole and try to bore this out and press another one in, of course you'd be into this area here. And it's just a kind of a problem. So I'm going to try an experiment here. I'm going to try to make a crosshead of the same dimension that will do the same job but that's, that's made in a different manner. Center holes here that line up with this on each side, which makes me think it was in some kind of, some kind of machine that turned this round. I don't know how it could have been done. So what I'm going to try to do is make one. And these are the side pieces that I showed you that I'm making. And this is this is the end piece here, which is a solid piece of mild steel. I'm going to weld it together. I'm going to V these out real heavily, so I'll have a lot of surface around for a very deep penetrating weld. Weld this on. <clears throat> then I'll be able to bore this and press in a hardened steel inch and a quarter diameter uh, pin. And I don't know whether I'm going to use uh, a piece of 4140 the ground and Harden, or whether I'm going to use, I could use a some hydraulic uh, cylinder rod, hard chrome or induction harden, just something better than this. <coughs> and then these side pieces here, I'm going to uh, machine them up as blocks that will go on each side with two bolts. Now I've got another engine that. Uh, the crosshead is made exactly that way and it's been a great little engine and it's run for years and years and I in fact the other day I took it apart to see how it was made so these side pieces that run in the slides is going to be bolted on here and I'm going to cut a key groove along each side and put a uh, tongue on the other piece so it'll fit in there a tongue and groove to give it a little more stability and uh, then of course bore this end out and tap it for the piston rod threads. So that's the plan and we're going to see how it works and this all may be part of a good design in the end for a production engine. Cutting the stock down the sides for the end of the crosshead quite a ways to go on it. This is a finished cut, 5 thousandths. I slowed the feed rate down to about 20 thousandths per stroke. That'll finish this side. down the 
sides for the crosshead sides. And uh, this will make two pieces, both left and right sides. I'll show you how that goes in a minute. Here's everything jigged up, parallel, relieved here, on top and bottom, and up the side. We're ready to weld. Okay, so here it is welded up and smoothed off a little bit. I put a uh, block in here, of course, to keep it from spreading when it or warping, and <clears throat> it didn't. It measures within a couple thousandths here and here. So we're ready to go to the next step. I got a final machine the, uh, the outside width here and put the groove down the middle. I'll do that in the uh, bigger G&E shaper that's electric powered. I got about uh, 20 thousandths to go, so I'm going to switch over to this tool here for finish. It's uh, a shear cutter. You see it's got about a 45 degree angle on the cutting surface, so it kind of shears the material off at an angle. And it's got just a little bit of a uh, crown to it. <clears throat> and it does a pretty good job on this type of steel for finish work. Looking for 1360 and that's 1363. So I'm going to leave it because the rails are adjustable anyway. Well, that's pretty good. And the surface finish is good. I have a quarter inch wide booby tool centered up on this and I'm going down uh, 62,000.
plain Jane Shaper. Uh,